Evan, do you want to take a seat? Uh, yes, if there's room for you. <laughs> there is. Okay, thank you. You can't just say that we're going to have our fight before lunch and escape, so he is going no, to no, take I a would seat. Never skip. No, you're not. I might skip lunch, but I would never skip the fight. <laughs> Um, fight or not, but a discussion and um, an energizing one for sure uh, we will have. Uh, additional restrictions modifying existing free and open source software licenses are becoming noticeably popular. Uh, we recently saw change of the license for the Redis modules. Um, we also saw uh, the change um, uh, from MongoDB in uh, issuing of the Neuroside public public license. Now, we wanted to bring all these amazing people here who are very knowledgeable about the issue because A, they have been involved into this and B, they have been practicing for a very long time around the open source community. Um, is this license proliferation under a new guise? Does it help business models or developers? And uh, was the problem that there was too much, there is too much freedom, and that's what we are trying to solve? So here are my great panelists, um, and I forgot their profiles. Again, I would urge you to read their profiles. They are too long. They're all very, very accomplished. I will start uh, from my very right, uh, Karen Copenhaver. <laughs> No, the profiles are long, Not but as short as some of <laughs> Karen serves as uh, outside counsel to the Linux Foundation. She was named the 2018, 16, 14, 2012 Boston Lawyer of the Year. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is um, Richard Fontana. Uh, he's senior commercial counsel at Red Hat, uh, an ex-colleague from the Software Freedom Law Center. And uh, then we have Heather Meeker. Um, Heather is um, a partner of, at O'Malley and Myers and leads their technology transaction practice. She's also a portfolio partner at OSS Capital, a venture fund specializing in open source software companies. Uh, welcome you all. Um, if you don't know who's on my left, perhaps. <laughs> Evan Moglen, obviously, and uh, we also have Sarah Ward, and Sarah is um, the general counsel at uh, MongoDB. Um, she's currently director legal at MongoDB, where she oversees the corporate and product legal teams. From 2014 to 2017, Sarah was senior corporate counsel, counsel at Critio, an advertising technology company specializing in securities and m and And last but not the least, Jim Wright who is Oracle's Chief Architect for Open Source Policy, Strategy, Compliance, and Alliances. And you can read further about these people and their involvement and their work. So um, I'm going to let, um, how we're going to run this panel is Evan is going to set some context about what is it that we are discussing in addition to the law stuff. And then each of the panelists, starting from Heather, will have an opening statement. And thereafter, we will ask some easy questions. So, right. Evan. so there's not much that needs to be said, I think, in advance of what the panelists will say for themselves. Um, the, the licenses that we have been using for decades now either implicitly rely upon or explicitly declare certain sets of freedoms which are crucial to people downstream from the licensors using the licenses. In the case of GPL and its family of copyleft licenses, we identified four freedoms. The freedom to run the program for any purpose. The freedom to modify the program for private or for public use. The opportunity to make and share copies of code, modified or unmodified, with any party of one's own choosing. These freedoms, which are users' freedoms, freedoms of those who come into possession of copies of the code, have been regarded by the parties who made and worked on free software or open source projects as crucial to their own relationship to the code they make. We have, in effect, created not merely a consensus about how to make software, we have created a consensus about how workers relate to users. But we are now experiencing pressure 
in the investment communities and around the businesses that produce software to modify those terms in ways which will more appropriately, in the view of the licensor companies, balance the market in which they are participating. This is undoubtedly going to continue to occur. Whether it is a threat to consensus or an evolution of consensus depends, I think, largely on the mind of the observer. But we need to have a conversation about it beginning from where we stand now. Are our basic four freedoms no longer suitable for a market which has changed too far? Or are people unnecessarily worried about their own commercial possibilities in the face of the long-term operations of the licenses? I think we have here a good diversity of view about that, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Heather, why don't we begin? Uh, thanks very much. Thanks uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to participate. Um, so, in case any of you are not aware, um, uh, I was involved in the drafting of Commons Clause, which came out recently. Um, I've also been involved in the drafting of a few other what I would call alternative licenses. Um, and that's probably the viewpoint I'm being asked to represent, so I'll do that. Um, I have to say that uh, I'll try to be precise about what is my view. I'm certainly not talking on behalf of any of my clients here today. Um, so uh, what is, I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of things very quickly. One, the pressure that you're seeing, at which Eben had mentioned, um, uh, previously today about the, the open source model being sort of challenged um, has to do, I think, in large part with what has happened in the software industry. So we have an open source model that's worked really well for a long time. It's still working really well. It's still robust. It's not going anywhere, etc. cetera. But uh, in particular, uh, as we've moved to a cloud-based um, implementation model, the triggers for uh, conditions under the open source licenses aren't, they're not getting triggered anymore. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of pressure on the copyleft model um, because uh, people uh, who are using software but not distributing it generally don't have any obligation or requirement to do anything to share with the community. Um, so companies that are developing software, particularly in a, in a kind of sector where it's very useful in the cloud, um, they are feeling a lot of economic pressure to step outside this model. So that's one thing I'll say about the, how we got to some of these suggestions for solutions. Um, the other thing I'll say is this, um, you know, I'm a lawyer in private practice. I've been doing this for almost 25 years. I'm a software licensing lawyer. Okay, so uh, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to, um, you know, tell you Santa Claus doesn't exist or anything, but <laughs> the fact is that what I've been doing for most of my career and what most software licensing lawyers do is write proprietary licenses. So we have this whole field of proprietary licenses. They're all ad hoc. Many of them are very difficult to understand. Uh, they, they are a, a huge due diligence issue. Okay, uh, I will say one thing. This is my view. You hear a lot of lawyers complaining about doing diligence on open source. That's easy. Okay, doing diligence on proprietary licenses is hard because everyone is different and you have to look, you have to noodle about what it means and you can't find any community, community discussion of it whatsoever. So what companies, when companies decide the open source model doesn't work for me, say for my primary product because I think I'm gonna get my lunch eaten and I won't have enough money to go on with my company, um, and you can, you can disagree with that assumption, but that's, that's the crossroads where they get to. They have a choice, and they're either going to go down the proprietary route, or they're going to do something that I would call an alternative 
open-ish model. It's not open source because it doesn't meet the, the user freedoms, et cetera. And usually that comes in, in the form of some kind of license restriction. So speaking for myself, I would say that open source is great. It's here to stay. It's not going away. But for, for developers who feel they need something different, what we really need is better proprietary licenses. We need them standardized, we need them understandable, and what we can get as an extra sort of peace benefit, if we think we can make this a big tent, is um, that we can get people to release code under licenses that make the source code available. Because if you go down the full-on proprietary route, then the source code won't be available. I would like to preserve some of the freedoms uh, if we can't preserve all of them. I, I'm a practical sort, I guess. And, uh, and so I, I am personally very interested in working on, um, uh, a, on a project to standardize proprietary licensing. And I only call it proprietary because it doesn't meet the four freedoms. It actually will have a lot in common with uh, open source licenses. So what I would say is, uh, I hope we can make this a big tent and not a small tent. I, I think that, you know, vilifying people who try alternative models is the same us versus them paradigm that, you know, caused a lot of pain for a lot of years. And um, I, would, uh, I would encourage people to be open-minded about uh, different kinds of licensing models. Jim? Houston? There we go. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, to begin with, obviously, right, we, Oracle is accustomed to publishing a, a, a substantial proportion of our portfolio under a dual license model. And, you know, I, I have watched these developments, um, I don't want to say bemused indifference, but, um, <laughs> The, it, it, it's been uh, interesting for me to observe, you know, the attacks on these license models. I, I guess um, I sort of sit in, in the same seat, you know, uh, coming previously from pri private practice as Heather, in that, you know, I view these licenses as, as I, I think the consensus is that they do not conform to what the majority of us think of as open source, right? Uh, which, which carries with it certain implications, you know, regarding um, content representations that you might make regarding the content of what you're what you're delivering. But that said, I guess. You know, to the extent that the social environment of open source development has at times been hostile to anything which is less than completely open source. Um, at, at, at times? <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, this it, this comes as this comes as no surprise, right? And, and I and I actually think, you know, it it may be somewhat of a moment of reckoning for the fact that companies need you know companies that release open source software need to make money sometime and sometimes they can't you know they they need to come up with models that make money, which may not always revolve around uh, which which may require them to alter their licensing on an outbound basis um, that said you know I guess I'll, I'll retort um, not all of us have found that the copyleft model doesn't work right um, and for Many of us, you know, when I when I see these, you know, I, I have seen the, these changes as a user, right? And um, 
part of my, I guess I'll say consternation uh, as an observer has been around uh, the promulgation of these licenses prior to any sort of community discussion or, or consensus, such that things like, you know, the, the implications of a license for a use across multiple affiliates in a large and complex organization. You know, are you, are you providing a service, even, even you know, at, in an internal use, where you have, inter, you know, uh, networks of intercompany agreements, right? Um, if you, you know, if, if you stand up a simple compute service, right? And uh, and then peop and then you're making available container images or, or VMs that contain a piece of software. Have you has has the you know are you now subject to a to reciprocal license obligations, right? For pieces of a service which was not which was never sort of directly connected with with the code in question. I think I think. While we, uh, I, I'm definitely not in the camp that with Max that we should that that license proliferation um, should prevent us from advancing the license ecosystem. I would, you know, obviously, I, right? I I drafted a license a few years ago, um, and I I don't think that we necessarily need to stand still in this regard, um, but I do think that careful consideration by the lot of assembled lawyers, many of whom are in this room, um, would probably benefit people who are trying to make these innovations. Sir? I know so much of the panel was gonna be Jim Wright fighting with himself. <laughs> <laughs> Color me ambivalent. <laughs> Sure, so um, I, I mean, I am coming from MongoDB, so uh, for those of you who don't know Mongo, we are a database platform and our core product is open source. Uh, and we recently made the decision to switch our license from AGPL to a new license that we introduced called the server-side public license. Um, and <clears throat> our rationale for doing this, our reason for doing this was you know, really along the lines of what Heather is talking about, which is that as our software has um, become more popular, and in particular our database as a service offering has become more popular, we have seen a lot of companies, uh, particularly international cloud providers, who are willing to test the boundaries of that license and offer a MongoDB as a service without contributing any code back. Um, so as a company that owns our IP, we kind of felt like we had three choices. One was to go closed source, one was to move to a source available license, and the third was to try and find an open source alternative that would um, you know, address the issue that we see and that other companies in our position see, but still allow you know, the, the, the broader community to benefit from the investment and the innovation that we're making in our open source database platform. So we chose option three, uh, somewhat controversially, and uh, introduced a license called the server-side public license, which is based on GPL, but has an additional provision, which essentially says, if you offer the licensed program as a service, you have to uh, open source the components of that service. Um, at the same time that we introduced the license, we submitted it to the OSI approval process, which is ongoing. Um, and you know, I know that there is some um, criticism of that choice in terms of the timing, uh, but for us as a public company um, with commercial interests, that was sort of the thing that was the right thing for us. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is, you know, we understood that introducing a new open source license would be controversial, but we felt like it was a necessary step for us, and it was really the only way that we could stay in the open source community in a way that made sense for our business. Um, but we do view this first version that we put out as a starting point for this conversation for us as a company and are open to iterating on that model based on kind of the feedback that we're getting through the process. Hi, 
Hi, so I, I also mentioned, um, in addition to being a lawyer at Red Hat, I'm uh, currently on the, the board of the Open Source Initiative, and I, uh, my, my term is sort of up in a, in a few months, and it's sort of a, a, a thankless uh, job in, in some ways. Um, and and I, 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 what, one of the things I do there is I, I kind of sort of de facto uh, manage the, the license approval process to the extent I, I can. And, and um, so, so Oh, um, David Levine mentioned OSI and FSF in, in one of his, his slides, the role that they play in kind of um, um, being the institutional uh, guarantors of, of meaning for what we, what we understand to be open source and, and free software. This is, for the OSI, this is very important. We're very concerned about um, the dilution of the meaning of open source. In a different sense, this is very important for a company like, like Red Hat, for, for, for which uh, open source is so important to its identity and, and its uh, business. So now I, I am, I think unlike some of my colleagues on the OSI, I, I'm actually, um, I've never been so concerned about license proliferation. Uh, I, I think that we should not be afraid of experimentation. Um, I was you know, in a certain sense glad to see uh, Jim's uh, license get kind of debated and approved and, and uh, um, and, and I think it's actually added uh, something to the, the suite of uh, licenses available to, to developers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I mean, it, it kind of took some conversations with Scott Peterson many years later for me to see what, what was sort of uniquely beneficial about, about uh, UPL as, as a license. But, but that, you know, that, that um, license was kind of iterated on through, through uh, it was many months of um, drafting, and, very sh and it's a very short license, you know, it's a very simple license, uh, unlike, uh, you know, <coughs> the current MongoDB. Um, license. So, so um, experimentation is good, but it depends on, on the way in which it's, it's done. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the, some of the way that, that some of this has been sort of rolled out. The, um, the commons clause, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a certain amount of what I think of, of as um, deception and, and kind of misleading communication surrounding the Commons Clause. So the very name Commons Clause seems to be suggestive of, cr of Creative Commons. Admittedly, Creative Commons has an anti-commercial uh, variety of licensing, but in the software realm, in the free software realm, commercialization, commercial freedom has always been a core value. Um, you know, com anti-commercial licenses are not new. The, the, the first version of the Linux kernel was under such a license. There were such licenses uh, that existed back in the 80s. They didn't really succeed in the software uh, realm. Um, but but these these the Commons clause is taking a a kind of you know a standard model of licensing that is supposed to guarantee commercial freedom and then tacking on an anti-commercial restriction in a way that I, I am concerned may, may uh, mislead developers and individual users who may, may not have the sophistication to, to understand that, that that fundamental value is being kind of stripped out and in a sense it's, it's being converted from being a commons license to an enclosure of a, of, of a commons. Uh, so, so there's a, the concern I have about, about um, sort of deceptiveness um, and, and the kind of misleading quality of, of around this. Uh, in Redis Labs has a page, uh, a website on uh, promoting um, some of the modules for, for Redis. And uh, I, I don't know if they fixed this, but for, for quite some time, they, after the Commons Clause was introduced, they were describing um, modules that were using the Commons Clause as being under OSI approved licenses. So this is an example of the, the kind of problem that I'm, I'm seeing. Um, now, I, I, I kind of agree with Jim that, um, that uh, uh, to the extent I think that, that Jim was making this point, that, that experimentation should be done um, by, uh, in, in a very multilateral way by a lot of uh, stakeholders. So, so um, I, I, I'm troubled by uh, what MongoDB has, has done in, not, not in proposing this license and, and in kind of um, testing the boundaries of, of what we should consider um, a, a copyleft license in the sort of cloud era, but rather taking a, a project that so many companies uh, and users depend on and um, changing the master branch to this new license before it's been approved and vetted by, by the community. I don't think that was necessary. I don't understand why that was, that was the only choice from a, from a business standpoint. But this has been very disruptive to, um, to users of, of MongoDB. So, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that um, we get to explore this issue of, of um, you know, what is the appropriate boundary 
for um, copyleft um, within the open source definition and, and to, to understand also what the Free Software Foundation considers to be the appropriate boundary for copyleft from a kind of free software definition uh, standpoint. But, but this should be done um, uh, in a very public way by, by, uh, w with input from developers and companies, uh, co commercial and uh, individual users, before um, commercially significant software is placed under these, these new licensing models. Could, can I just say that I disagree that what Redis did was misleading. Um, if you want to look at Redis's site and see whether you think it's misleading, please go ahead and look at the site. Um, you know, the fact that two things have the same initials doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're misleading. <laughs> Um, or even similar initials. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, if you, I think if you look at the messaging, one of the first things it says is this is not open source. Uh, maybe there were, I, I never saw what you saw, to be fair, and I'm not saying that it's you didn't possible. see it, it. It's an oversight, so, so I, I don't know. It may have been corrected by now. So. Karen? But, but, but it, it's, I, I guess, I, let me just add one thing, and I, I think Karen, need, Karen needs her turn here, but, um, just speaking as a consumer of, of these products, as well as a, as a producer of a lot of this stuff, um, having to disentangle stuff that comports with the four freedoms from stuff that has effective, that effectively no longer comports, right? Such that if I have a, if I have a development team that is consuming Redis, right, I now have to tell those folks, hey, you need to make very sure that you don't touch any of this stuff. And for every release, now and forevermore, I, need, I, I, I literally had to say this to people. Like, for every release, now and forevermore, I need you to look at every single module and make sure that they did not add this clause to any of it, right? And for all we know, they may add it, you know, they, they have taken this closed source, right, in part. We don't know whether it will be taken closed source in whole, right? to the extent that we have made representations to any of our customers about the content of any of this stuff, right? Um, or, 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 uh, or otherwise are making commercial use of any of it, right? Um, it, it has now become somewhat radioactive and my, my concern there is that when you, that this was, changed from open source to proprietary, right? And I think those things, you know, do need, they need to be cleanly severed, right? Ir irrespective of whether there was any sort of misrepresentation on the site or, or whatever, right? Which, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I ever read anything like that because I didn't. But alterations of license in a way that take something from a piece of code that comp comports with the open source definition or then and the four freedoms to something which no longer does that um, need, you know, I guess th that affects users dramatically. And, you know, the, the, as a consumer that, you know, that the steps that I've had to take, that I've had to tell, tell my development teams to take, right, around the consumption of this code are fairly drastic and I guess. Let me pick yeah, up on yeah. that. Okay, uh, I think I'm on. Because I, I want to go back and, and talk about community. I want to talk about license proliferation. I want to talk about a bunch of other things. Number one, we would not be here without the work of some unbelievable developers, starting with Richard Stallman, who wrote the, the tool set, and going through the Linux kernel developers, who build an infrastructure on which everything we're talking about in terms of business models is entirely dependent. And that infrastructure was built by developers who had certain assumptions. And the, the, the value that they brought is why we're all here and why Nicholas is here. Nikolai, sorry. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding to think about what has been achieved in a couple of decades. There were a few threats along the way that, uh, that were problematic to the commercial um, embrace of all of this. And one of the big ones 
was FUD, was the difficulty, and I know that there are, I can look around this room and see so many people who spent so much time talking to each lawyer at each corporation that was brought into this conversation to get them to the point where they thought it was a commercially reasonable act to use these things. That was a huge process. We also, we did go through this period of license proliferation where there, you know, we, we lost the value of these community assets. And I love, um, you know, St Scott Peterson's discussion about shared resources. And the license proliferation issue was one where we were diminishing the value of resources because we had gotten to the point, which I could not agree with Heather, you know, more that proprietary license are far more complex than these. But the open source community is based on a confidence in the use of some shared resources in a <coughs> frictionless manner to come together and to develop infrastructure that is absolutely essential to everybody else, including all these people who want to build business models on top of it. And we as a community have a responsibility to preserve, one, the expectations of those developers, and two, this unbelievable engine of creativity and infrastructure that has been built. And my concern about all of these is really going back to a time that uh, where people are afraid to use this stuff because it's chaotic. And number two, where the new communities that come in, or the new co companies and participants that come into this community, think that creating something new, that doing something in a unique way, that losing the things that were the secret sauce on which all of this happened, that those are not essential to the magic that has happened. That's what I'm concerned about, is losing that in the conversation. And um, we have never been able to force corporations to do anything with their intellectual property, and we never will. There was a compelling and commanding necessity to use these assets that these developers built because they were so excellent. We do not want to lose you know, the magic of that business model. I would also suggest to you that we have been through you know, dual licensing models and other things for many years. I cannot identify very many of these absolutely fundamental assets that have driven the success that we've had that came out of those models. They were good, not that they're not good models for you know, some business, not that they don't create employment, which is very important to me, not that they don't do good things. But if that's all we had, we would not be celebrating peace today. So, so I, I just want to flag one thing. So, A, some of us still like dual licensing. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, fair enough, David. Um, but, but I guess the, the, the measures that I was talking about earlier, right, w w with respect to, you know, the, the technical measures Absolutely. that I've had, that I have, that I have witnessed here, w is merely that the idea that well-established open source projects may go closed source, you know, may effectively go closed source at any moment, right, then requires us to undertake the, you know, the, the potential obligation to maintain those things entirely on our own, right, to be able to do, create security patches without support from the original development teams, the, the, the FUD, right, the fear that is associated with that, the, the risk associated with the fear is very high, and the actual business risk is very high, right? I mean, I, I, before I can pick up something, I need, I need to know that or I need to at least, I need to be able to know, at, you know, systemically as a whole, right, that these projects are not very likely to just shut down tomorrow mm -hmm. to my teams. So, so I, I, I I'm just, gonna ask a few questions and then okay. let you uh, speak. And Heather and Sarah, the first question, I can take this. Uh, so it seems like it's camouflage proprietary licensing 
Um, we don't have freedom zero in that sense. And uh, so why do the communities who have already built and who come to open source because there are certain values continue to work in these business models because we are kind of destroying the basic principles on which the communities rely on. And that's why they're interested in open source. That's why they build it. Um, and if this is the way we are going to decide about, uh, we are going to make licenses, then why do these, why, why does the labor continue to work with the community here? Well, so if you're talking about commons clause, that is not camouflage proprietary licensing. <laughs> it's proprietary licensing. Okay. If, if the definition of proprietary is not open source. Mm -hmm. it, actually, I think that we have a real definitional problem in the community is that we don't have a good word for something that's in the middle. And I would actually, if, you know, unless, unless it's morally repugnant to you mm -hmm. to do so, I, I would suggest that it would be great if we could come up with some more useful terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't call it open source, maybe we can't even call it open, maybe we can't call it common, I don't know. But there is something that's different from an end user license for Microsoft Word, right? And it is, here's the source code, do whatever you want with it, but, uh, but some kind of commercial-based restriction. Um, I actually think that's different from what most of us think of as proprietary. So Commons Clause is not camouflage, it is proprietary. Um, as to the sort of ultra strong copyleft question, which is really quite different, that has all the freedoms, there's just an argument over the scope of copyleft. I think that's actually a different discussion and I don't know that it's really accurate to call it camouflage proprietary. Um, that's that's really, I think, an argument about how, how broad should copyleft be in order to create a level playing field. But I'll let Sarah speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think, as I said, as a company, we thought we had three options. And I think that there's a lot of skepticism, which is healthy, around what we're doing since we are a um, commercial enterprise. But <clears throat> from our perspective, we genuinely, we do want to maintain that relationship with developers and that is why we chose the path that we chose. Um, I think, you know, it's obviously going further than what has um, been done before in the open source community, but we wouldn't have submitted it to OSI. Uh, we wouldn't be going this way if we didn't truly think that we are still trying to adhere to those principles and, um, you know, find a way to work with developers in the way that we have been in the past. So uh, that's like, um, so it seems like business judgments are driving certain decisions. Are we seeing a trend where perhaps copyright licenses would be written to address a very na narrow range of competitors, uh, like in this particular case? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think in our case, you know, part of, our uh, motivation in doing this was obviously our particular business concern. Um, we did part of part of you know the criticism that we've gotten and part of the issue with the license is that we have actually tried to draft it um, so that it is more broadly uh, applicable and and that's much harder. Um, uh, but you know, I, I I think that there are already. I mean, I'm not an open source expert, but I think that there are already open source licenses um, that are. Um, you know, that apply differently to different use cases, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily a problem. Uh, I would also say that, like, these notions you asked about drafting things to go to particular competitors, I, I think what we're going to see a lot more of is non-commercial type restrictions or, um, or, or something sort of similar. And just for those of you who have never sort of been through the process of, say, negotiating a merger agreement in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> drafting things, definitions of things like non-commercial um, is extremely challenging. And uh, I'm sure that any, you know, the lawyers in the room who have advised clients on, say, Creative Commons 
have struggled with this as well. If you look at the, the guidance that Creative Commons gives on the non-commercial restriction, there's precious little. I'm not faulting them for that. It's very difficult, but I think it would be worthwhile to come up with a community consensus on what that means. It might be very helpful to people, um, and, but from a pure drafting point of view, it's actually a very challenging thing to come up with in a, in a general case without saying specifically, you know, these people can't use it, which is fundamentally, you know, it's not robust enough. Anybody who's ever done this in private practice knows that breaks down in a year, right? <laughs> because you can't identify the people anymore and they all merge and change, et cetera. But I do think that some more consensus around what constitutes non-commercial might be helpful. Richard, you wanted to jump in earlier. Was it about uh, when Heather said uh, there has to be some definition or some other term, which is? No, I, I wanted to make a point. One of the things I wanted to say um, is actually kind of related to what Jim was saying about the problem, the practical problems I think he's seeing in, in the way he provides advice. Um, to his engineers, so uh, this is more of a, this is a Red Hat perspective. So, so um, you know, Red Hat can't practically uh, distribute software that's only under OSI-approved licenses because there are, uh, for the stacks we we ship, um, there's lots of stuff that uh, there's hundreds of licenses that that have never been approved by the OSI, have never been recognized as free software licenses by the FSF. Um, and, and there never will be. It's just uh, there's so much legacy stuff. But they all kind of um, conform to a, a certain pattern, a certain range of restrictiveness and permissiveness. And this makes me think of uh, something that Max mentioned, uh, the, the uh, numerous, uh, numerous uh, clauses, yes. Uh, th this, this concept that, that um, if you apply it to open source, uh, th this idea that what, what, it, what we think of as open source, legitimately open source, is a, a certain limited set of combinations of possible conditions and, and, and freedoms. Um, for Red Hat, that's actually, in an informal way, very important to um, uh, our relationship with our customers. We, our, our customers can't you know, practically be expected to, to read every line of every license of every piece of software, every every single file or snippet of source code that, that we ship in our stacks, but but they, they need to understand um, and have comfort that what we are committed to um, a, a, a kind of definition of, of open source and free software that that um, is such that that we with with maybe some rare exceptions we will be only we will only be shipping software that's under licenses that that um, kind of conform to that that that, that sort of scope. And when you start to see, um, I mean, certainly when, when, when something like Commons Clause licenses become possible uh, to, as part of a kind of larger um, project community uh, ecosystem, or, or uh, in the case of the, the MongoDB license, the new MongoDB license, um, th that, that license as it currently exists contains such a severe restriction that goes so far beyond um, a license like the AGPL, even though it only affects a, a kind of narrow scenario, it, this, this is a very practical, uh, practically difficult problem for, for our customers who are trying to understand um, you know, the range of, of um, potential license terms that will be um, part of our stack. We, we can't, um, we, can, we can no longer really say um, something to the effect that, that AGPL represents the outer bound of uh, what's legitimately a copyleft open source license. And so there's a, there's a, a, a real practical problem for um, those of us who are in the kind of uh, open source, big open source product distribution business because, because um, suddenly customers are gonna think that they, they really do need to to um, understand every line of every license, which is um, sounds like something that maybe they should do, but it's actually commercially Im impractical in many respects. So I think the important point here uh, is that people are experiencing significant commercial disruptions from a massive alteration in the way world IT works that we made possible. Um, we want to listen to the problems of the businesses. We always did want to listen to the problems of the businesses. As has been pointed out, GPL3 was made mostly by listening 
to all the businesses in the world that cared to talk to us on the basis that we would break no business model if it could be avoided at any cost. Um, it's true that Max Ochoa of TiVo didn't think we really meant it, but we really meant it. Uh, we, we would break no business model that we could avoid breaking in order to achieve safety for users. I think we are experiencing now a situation in which people who are suffering significant commercial disruptions wish to respond to those disruptions in whatever way is good for their business. That's perfectly understandable. It should not come out of users' rights. That is not the place where the relationship between software infrastructure makers and Amazon Web Services should be adjusted. Users' rights should be regarded as the key reason that all of this works in the first place. And we should be extremely reluctant to subsidize commercial difficulties on the backs of users. This is where creativity is really required. I do not think that the consensus in favor of FOSS is going to break down and we're going to find ourselves in a world of non-commercial proprietary licenses. That's not what's going to happen. It's not going to happen, first of all, because the social contract with workers is really important. And it is not clear that workers will agree to produce unfree software at the same prices that they produce free software. They, re they receive an enormous wage from freedom, which has transformed the workforce around the world. And I think that's still going to matter. And these are relicensing activities. These are not people building a better mousetrap and licensing it proprietary. These are people who are signing up to compete with themselves. That has a long natural history, and it usually works out badly. The question is, why do the forkers not fork, given all the downstream uneasiness that people are experiencing? The minute there's a fork under the old licenses, all those downstream people can go away happy again. So the market works, ladies and gentlemen, the market works. Those of us who made this stuff happen, we wanted the market to work. We've labored long and hard to make the market work. We want to labor long and hard to help the businesses that are struggling now with conditions that we helped to create. We think that's part of our responsibility. But as a movement, I do not understand why we would engage in cheating on users' rights in order to help businesses solve business problems. We never had to do that before. Why should we have to do that now? So what does license stewardship mean in this context now that we've established it? That this is, there are different forces pulling everything in different directions. In, in such a case, what does license stewardship mean? Looking at me, and I'm not a licensed steward. <laughs> LF does have a lot of projects, and um, there are principles. And there, there are there are principles, and you know, Richard would be much better to talk about the um, OSI approval process as a you know means of of of, of uh, establishing the validity of a particular license. I would I would say again, focusing on these shared community assets and as, and acknowledging the fact that you know we. We cannot limit or prohibit, you know, the, the use of other structures, but focusing on the preservation of these shared community assets. The work that's been done that David was talking about in terms of taking those assets and maintaining their stability through an evolution process that is broadly, uh, you know, uh, disseminated for consensus purposes over a long period of time without a declaration from one particular party or one particular el you know, area that says, you know, we're, we're going to go and destabilize this. That process cannot be hurried and cannot be undervalued. But these shared assets need to be, you know, need to be preserved. And the OSI process is one piece of preserving the OSI definition. I have to say, in a lot of these conversations, I think that there's a confusion between the OSI definition for what a license is and this broader discussion of what the expectations of developers are around what an open source development process is. And I think we should honor the developers' expectations because um, we're, we're, we're taking terminology that is very valuable to them and that they have their life work invested in and potentially, you know, um, destroying the value of it by because we just want to you know use the same terminology because we want a little bit of the glitter to um, to to cover other things 
So, so, the li so for the licensed stewards, I mean, there's, there are issues about who wrote you know, the original license a long time ago, and you know, can it be, uh, is, is, are they the ones that maintain control? In certain situations, that's obviously true. I mean, Richard was very formal about his, his uh, p position with respect to the, to the GPL. In other licenses that we've all used, there isn't an obvious steward. And that's, and that's raised some questions about you know, the whole issue about what the MIT license means and what else. What those licenses mean is, um, is what each of us using those licenses on code that we owned you know, intended it to mean. Um, and, but will we know exactly what it means? You know, short of the litigation process where we have a court in a particular context you know, with two parties who have very differing interests and are not at all concerned with how they're impacting the overall community, they will determine what the license means in that particular instance. I don't think we run our communities based on that. I think we run our communities based on the developers' expectations of what the environment is that they want to work in because every corporation that's represented in this room is, um, is, uh, is here in part because the developers themselves demanded this environment. The very best developers demanded this environment in order for them to work on projects within these companies. Um, I have many more questions, but I'm being told and signed that we're already late, so I'm going to ask each of you just to summarize, uh, starting from you, Richard. And very short. Yeah, so, so um, uh, again, experimentation in, in how to draft free software and open source licenses is very valuable. I've tried my hand at, at, at trying to create a simpler copyleft license. Um, I hope that kind of experiment uh, continues. I think we, we also need to look at, at um, how, what, um, what copyleft should look like in an era of um, cloud providers. Uh, um, however, again, th this is um, something that has to be done publicly and multilaterally. Um, shouldn't be done by single corporations um, relicensing a uh, very valuable project um, under a new license before it's been uh, kind of adequately vetted by the community. And um, and these 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 boundaries that are policed by OSI and FSF and and others like like uh, Debian and and the Fedora project, the other distributions. Um, this is very important. Uh, it's very important uh, to to um, to make sure that that um, um, e even though open has a a kind of pure development process meaning now, um, it is very much uh, tied, in, in my view, to to the legal meaning, the the license uh, sort of meaning of of open. And and w if we start to chip away at that, um, we've always been concerned about about that getting diluted and and um, the, the um, commercial advantage, I, I would worry that the commercial advantages of open source development would um, start to be endangered if that happens. Heather? Well, first, Karen, thanks for mentioning that some of us have been spending decades talking people off the ledge on open source because that's been most of my career. Um, so <laughs> those of you who don't know me already um, maybe want to keep that in mind. Um, I'm not here to say that you know we need to change open source because I think it works great. Um, but if you share an interest in, say, fixing proprietary licenses, <laughs> Or, alternatively, you have some notions of what we might call something different. Please, I would love to hear your input on it because it's something that I have been thinking about a lot lately and would love to get uh, co some community input on. Sarah? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess just in closing, I would say um, on this issue, um, you know, I, I speak for one company, so that's the, the position that we're coming at with this, but uh, I think that there is um, there is a threat here with the cloud era for businesses who are trying to operate as open source businesses in that environment. And um, while you know there's issues with companies unilaterally making these decisions, I think there are a ton of businesses that are interested in this um, and are part, willing to be part of that conversation, but have real business needs that need to be addressed in the interim while that public process is occurring. 
I, I guess I'll, I'll revert back to, um, I think that there are, you know, the existing models still work pretty darn well, I think, um, that, you know, we, for, for many of us, the, the copy left is functioning just fine. And, you know, we are, we are getting the code contributions back. That said, you know, there are challenges in the cloud era. Everybody's are different. Um, I think the reaction of the community should be to have a, you know, it has to be one at a time, right, to look at these. I think the experimentation is good. And, you know, with respect to, to what, um, what Mongo is doing, I think the willingness of developers to experiment, you know, is, isn't something that should generate, you know, um, vitriol, right? But, but rather that, you know, we can continue to work on this as a community just like we work on the code as a community. Well, you see how it is. Even the fights sound different in an era of peace. No? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to risk delaying people's lunch any further. Thanks to the generosity of the Open Invention Network, there is lunch for everybody. And I hope plenty of conversation about these and other subjects before we resume at 2.30. Thank you very much for being with us all this time. Thank you.